Uh, hello friends, I am Dr. Nikita Nalmani. Today we would be discussing the orthopedic image-based questions because now NEET has many image-based questions. So orthopedics has many clinical signs which can be asked plus the fractures as we know and the other radiological findings. So we will go through it starting with the first slide. The first slide you are given an image and you are asked to identify the fracture and this is Jefferson fracture. What is Jefferson fracture? It is fracture of the cervical vertebra. Which cervical vertebra? C1. How do you remember that? Jefferson is ON, that is ONE1. So that's a Jefferson fracture. That is the atlas, the posterior arch showing the fracture bilaterally and the anterior arch showing the fracture. So that's a complete ring fracture of the C1 vertebra. That is Jefferson fracture. That is how you identify Jefferson fracture. Next image, if you are asked to identify, then this is a CT scan because the bones are white. What do we see here? That is the atlas, the C1 vertebra. This is the C2 axis vertebra and we see a break in the cortex here. So that is a C2 fracture. On an axial CT, this is a C2 fracture, fracture of the pedicle of C2. So that becomes the hangman's fracture. So, hangman's fracture is C2 axis fracture. Next slide, again we see that this is a CT scan because the vertebrae, the bones are white. This is a CT of the cervical spine. So, that's the C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. What do we see here? The arrow points to the fracture of the spinous process of C7. So that's a lower cervical vertebra, spinous process fracture. So that becomes clay shoveler's fracture. Correct? Clay shoveler's again is cervical spine fracture, cervical spine and spinous process. S stands for spinous process. So cervical vertebra, spinous process fracture is clay shoveler's fracture. Coming to the next slide. Now this is a x-ray. This x-ray shows the fracture of clavicle. That is the clavicle, there is a break in the clavicle, so that becomes clavicle fracture and this becomes the acromion process of the scapula. In the images, you might also be asked to identify just the anatomy, so that is the clavicle, the acromion process, the humerus and the scapula. So there is a fracture of clavicle and you might be asked what is this brace used for in which fracture. So that is a figure of 8 figure of 8 brace or figure of 8 bandage used in clavicle fracture. Very important and frequently asked. Coming to the next image. Now, this is a lateral x-ray of the elbow. How do you identify that? That's the humerus. This is the radius and the ulna. That's the olecranon process. So, this becomes ulna and this is the radius. And we see a break in the lower humerus. So, the condyles are separated from the shaft. So, that's a supracondylar fracture humerus. Correct? Supracondylar fracture humerus. Then, coming to the complications of supracondylar fracture humerus. First of all, you should know what is a carrying angle. A carrying angle is used for the elbow. Again, that's an MCQ asked. A carrying angle is calculated at the elbow. So, you measure this angle here and... If you see a deformity like this, that is the angle is deviated, the angle is opening medially towards the body, that is called cubitus varus. And if you see the angle opening outside, the angle is opening outside, so that is cubitus valgus. So, this becomes cubitus varus, the angle opening internally and this becomes cubitus valgus, the angle opening outside. So, cubitus varus is a complication of supracondylar fracture humerus and cubitus valgus is a complication of lateral condyle fracture of humerus. How do you remember? Valgus is L that is lateral condyle fracture humerus and varus is supracondylar fracture. Again, a very frequently asked image and the deformity is the gun stock deformity. As you can see, like the gun, there is a deformity, the gun stock deformity. Again, it is a complication of supracondylar fracture humerus. So, gun stock deformity seen in supracondylar fracture humerus.
Now, this is again another complication of supracondylar fracture humerus where you see this contracture in the hand and that is called the Volkmann's contracture. How do you identify that? You get a flexion at the wrist and the flexion at the fingers. This is again complication of supracondylar fracture humerus and that is because the flexor muscles contract. They go into contracture. So everything goes into flexion because of the ischemia. So you have this contracture flexion at the wrist, at the fingers and that is workman's contracture, complication of supracondylar fracture humerus. Now this is a x-ray elbow. You might just be asked to identify radius, ulna, olecranon, medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle. So an easy way to identify these structures is, so that is the humerus and the paired bones obviously becomes the forearm. So one of them is radius, one is ulna. How do you identify is? The olecranon goes behind the humerus. It goes behind the humerus and sits there in the trochlea. So olecranon process, that is why this is ulna. And this is the radius, that is the head of the radius, the radial tubercle. Now radius is on the lateral side. So that is why the corresponding epicondyle becomes the lateral epicondyle. Olecranon process, ulna is on the medial side. So the epicondyle of humerus becomes the medial epicondyle. Correct? So now in this image, if you are asked to identify the fracture, whether it's a lateral epicondyle or medial epicondyle, first you should look at the bones of the forearm. So that is the radius head, that is the olecranon. So this is radius ulna. Since it is radius, the fracture is on the side of the radius. This becomes lateral epicondyle fracture. And if you see in this image, radius, olecranon process, so ulna, the medial side ulna and that is why there is a fracture of the medial epicondyle of humerus. So that is a lateral epicondyle fracture and this is medial epicondyle fracture. Now coming to this very important fracture and that is called Coley's fracture. Why is it a Coley's fracture? First of all, it's a fracture of radius, distal radius and the distal bone, the fracture fragment is displaced dorsally, correct? So you have this ulna, the radius, it's fractured and the bone is displaced dorsally. So that is Coley's fracture. Again here you identify by this is the ulna, this is the radius, distal radial fracture, most common Coley's with dorsal displacement. So that is Coley's fracture and this is the classical dinner fork deformity seen in Coley's fracture because the fracture fragment is going dorsally. So you see it like a dinner fork. So the dinner fork deformity, you might just be given this image with a dinner fork deformity, the dorsal angulation of the fracture fragment and you might be asked what fracture is it. So that is dinner fork deformity of Coley's fracture. The thing you need to identify is the dorsal angulation at the wrist because of the dorsally displaced fracture fragment. 